Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles program, a talk show podcast called Things We Said Today. This is a show in which we talk about anything that has to do with the Beatles, their past, the present, the future, the group, their solo careers, whatever we feel like talking about. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of this show. Hopefully you know me for my other Beatles program, a radio show, a syndicated show called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my two other co-hosts. First of all, the man who for many years wrote for uh, Beatles Examiner. Now he writes for a number of sites, Access.com, AXS.com, Variety, uh, Goldmine, Billboard, you name it. He's all over the place. And that's Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And our other co-host has... uh, been involved for many years writing articles in the classical world for the New York Times, and he's also the author of, well, recently, the ebook, Got That Something, How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. He's also the author of The Beatles From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and that is Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken. Hello, Steve. Hello, everyone. <laughs> We're in a giggly mood tonight, aren't we? <laughs> yes, we are. Well, on the, the program this time, you may have noticed that in the last several shows, we haven't been covering the news. And that's for several reasons, and that's because we've had some really great guests on our show, from Mark Lewison to uh, Joey Molland and David Bedford, and also due to some time constraints as well. But we thought that um, on the program this time out, we'd catch up and talk about some of the things that have been happening in the last several weeks. And there's quite a lot to talk about here and also uh, things to come as well. So I thought we'd start by talking about, first of all, uh, a release coming out on December 15th, actual several uh, Beatles releases, one of which happens to be the Beatles' Christmas messages coming out in a box set. And each message will be released on 7-inch vinyl single. It's colored vinyl with the original artwork that came with it through the fan club. So let me ask uh, the two of you how you feel about this release. Have you seen it yet? Have either of you picked it up? I know it's early. You could uh, pre-order it. And if you're interested in buying it as well. Uh, Alan, let's start with you. Um, well, I pre-ordered it. I haven't seen it yet. If there are press comps, they haven't turned up. I have to say I'm a little underwhelmed. First of all, releasing it only on vinyl, I mean, it, it's a limited edition, so okay, they don't have to sell millions of them, but there are, you know, there is a, a limited number of people who are still equipped to play vinyl, Um and actually, even a lot of turntables these days just have 33, not 45. So they're kind of making it a little hard to play. On the other hand, I think everyone who's going to order it already has it on bootlegs, so uh, they could play the bootlegs and just keep keep the new vinyl one fresh. I don't know. I, I, I will be curious to see whether they're edited at all. Um hmm. Because, you know, I mean, they say, they say some things that they might not say today, I mean, here and there. Uh, and you never know. I mean, they may edit some things or they may not. Uh, they haven't said whether they're intact. I would have thought if they had done it as a CD release or even a download, they could have added some of the outtakes and things which have been circulating for years on bootlegs and some mm-hmm. of which are kind of funny, you know, I mean, just alternate things. Not to mention, it would be really nice to have a good quality version of all of Christmas Time is Here Again. <laughs> you know, the the one that's been bootlegged, there's only, you know, is basically from what they call the EMI boardroom tape, which is sort of taped with a live mic as a bunch of EMI executives are playing it and it's not horrible quality but it's not you know right off the master to you know to cd or or even vinyl it's uh and and the bits that they've put out around the time of the anthology are just you know fragmentary so 
um, that the whole song goes on for something like, something like seven minutes. I mean, it's it's just repeated over and over. But I, I'd still like to have a nice nice quality copy of that. Mm-hmm. So we are we just talking about the Christmas records or the other stuff too? We'll talk about that in a moment. But okay. I wanted to hear what what you had to say about it, Steve. I'm frankly wondering the logic of why they did what they did. I mean, I. You know, when I heard about this, I was a little, I was a little excited, you know, because it's about time that they put these things out. Mm -hmm. And I always, I always hoped they would and put them out on CD and not do, not putting out a CD is just totally mind blowing. I don't understand why they didn't do that. Not even, uh, of course, the outtakes would have been great, but just put the damn things out on CD. I Uh mean, that would have been i think that would have been great it would have gotten a lot of airplay that way i don't think it's going to get much airplay on vinyl honestly but then to you know to do it i mean it's nice that they've done the archive you know with the with the artwork and they they have the new booklet but there's really nothing extra and i've seen so many people say i've had the, the bootleg cd's for years why should i why should i buy this right and you know, without even any uh, any outtakes, it's it's silly. I mean, it's it doesn't make any sense. And I, re- somebody has suggest I've seen people suggest that well, maybe it'll be on CD next year. That's crazy. It should have done. It should have been this year. Mm-hmm. Why they? You know, if they were going to do this box set, you know, put the CD out first, then put the vinyl out later. You know, not put the 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 vinyl box out first. But right. I'm I'm just totally you know I, I I really don't understand why they've decided to do this at all the way they have. Um, well, I just think that there are certain releases that are meant to be mass market and some that are strictly for the collector, and this is for the collector because most Beatle fans, the only ones that have any interest in buying this, really want it so that they can complete their collection. They'll have it on colored vinyl. They'll have the artwork. And it's, it'll be in a nice package, in a box. And that means something to a lot of fans who collect that kind of thing. But I do feel, just like the two of you feel, that it should come out on CD. And um, although I personally think it won't, and I don't know for sure, you never know if a couple months later it might come out on CD. Because there's so many instances where actually the opposite has happened. When something comes out on CD and then they wait a couple of months before the vinyl comes out. But I certainly think that there's a need for the Christmas messages to be released commercially because a lot of mainstream fans have either heard it, want a legitimate copy, may not think about hunting for a bootleg copy. And um, on top of all that, there's a lot of radio stations out there that I'm sure if it was a legitimate copy, if if it was released legitimately, they'd be more likely to play it on the air. Exactly. And they won't have to, you know, try to hunt it down or know someone that's a Beatle fan that has a copy that can send them a copy on MP3 or whatever. It should just be out there for the mass market on CD. Whether or not you feel outtakes should be included as well, but at least those uh, those seven messages should be out on CD as well, not just for the collector in in this box set. We'll have I- to wait and see what happens. I, I think had they had they put them out on CD, and it may still happen that a lot of stations will incorporate the the, mes- the early, especially the early messages, which are really perfect for playing on the radio. The later ones, not so much. But you know, I think had they had they put them on CD, you would have heard them a lot this Christmas. Mm-hmm. I don't think I don't think you're going to hear them that much, but. Yeah, I mean, it it really they really kind of hurt. It seems like they they hurt themselves by not putting it out on CD and making them more accessible, because the idea of putting the messages out is these things are archival, and you know people have wanted them or people who don't know about them, and I'm sure there's a lot of people that never heard of these things, you know, uh, want to hear them. And when they hear them, they'll especially the early ones. They'll go, "Oh wow, you know these are like back to the days of Beatlemania." I mean, those initial messages were extremely cute. They would, and I think they would get played on on Christmas stations a lot. You know, yeah. 
So well, I think it's it's an important part of their history because each message mirrored what they were going through at that time. Right. And it also showed their sense of humor. And the fact that this was such a unique thing for them to do for their fans, I think that's kind of important to bring out and make the public more aware of. Mm-hmm. I, don't, of I, I disagree with what you said, though, about putting it out on vinyl or on CD a few months later. If it comes out on vinyl, it won't be until next year. They'll wait until, right. they'll wait until next Christmas. You mean on CD? So, yeah, on CD, yeah. And I think that's that's really kind of dumb, you know. I mean, yeah, just crazy. All right. Also, the same date, December 15th, we have Sgt. Pepper coming out as a limited edition picture disc and also on 180 gram limited edition single vinyl editions. Also coming out on high definition digital audio. So how do you both feel about that? We'll start with Steve this time. Yawn. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, they, they had the vinyl. There was vinyl in the deluxe set. So, you know, I don't know why they're, why they're doing this. The, as for picture discs, i gotta, I got to be honest. I've never been a big fan of picture discs, as collectible as they may be. It's not something I, I you know, I went crazy over back in the days when they were around a lot more. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the music is the most important, not the not the vinyl. So either way, I mean, I'm not, I'm really not enthusiastic about either one of these things. Mm-hmm. So, all right, how about you, Alan? Okay, so um, when the last Sergeant Pepper was coming out, I, hadn't we calculated that I that I already owned something like 23 or 25? copies of Sgt. Pepper. So, <laughs> um, that what, and, that what it was? and among those are two different picture discs that came out in the 70s. You know, only, I, only two? Only yeah, two? Yeah, I only have two. Uh, one is from Germany, one of them may be American, but, and you know, different designs, but uh, mm. this one, I don't know. I mean, I don't really, I, I, I feel almost as if it's abusive. <laughs> Having just you know put out several versions of Sergeant Pepper that I you know that I bought all the variations of to now have new ones. I mean I bought the vinyl, and the vinyl has two discs, so there was you know Pepper plus one disc of outtakes like on the two CD one which mm-hmm. I also bought. Um, so buying a single vinyl now, I already have a 180 gram version on vinyl. Hell, I've got the Mobile Fidelity UHQR. I don't know how heavy that is, but that was <laughs> possibly more than 180 grams. So I, I you know, I, I I can't really tell what will happen. It's very possible that I'll be walking through Bull Moose Records here in Portland um, in a couple of weeks and see them there and say, oh, I'll buy them, you know, and just buy them. But but in principle, I, I'm not really counting on buying those because I think I have enough Sgt. Peppers. Now, the, the high-res download I may get because, you know, high-res is at least a different kind of format that is, you know, at least potentially – better quality than you would get on a CD or on vinyl. So I may go for that, for that reason. Okay. Yeah. All right. As far as I'm concerned, this is the kind of thing that doesn't really interest me. But we're bringing this up because there'll always be Beatles fans out there that have to have everything. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we should be concerned about every level of fan that's out there, I feel. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah. you know, I have one of the Sgt. Pepper picture discs that I remember buying in the 80s as a cutout. I only bought it because it was a cutout. And Mm -hmm. the very nature of the fact that it's a picture disc meant that I wasn't going to play it. You just buy it so you can have it as a collector's item. Right. So, uh, and I'm not one of those people that has to have every version of everything that's out there. As long as I have every recording that's out there. Yeah. That's what's important to me. That's far more important. You know, when when it came to singles with non-LP B-sides, I had to have them. When it came to CD singles with songs on there that weren't on the albums, I had to have them. Right. When it came to remasters, I had to get them because of the, the better sound quality and because of the bonus material. That's what I go for. I don't have to get every version that comes out over and over and over again. But if there's anything that's 
unreleased up to that point that's on the new release, then I have to have it. So that's yeah. that's how I am anyway. Yeah, they may have I'll, finally cured me of that have to have everything thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So along the same lines, something which I believe is for the collector, going back to November 17th, Paul McCartney, The Archive Collection. Eight of his albums released on 180 gram limited edition colored vinyl, 180 gram black vinyl, single CD digipack as well. That's from McCartney, Ram, Band on the Run, Venus and Mars, Speed of Sound, McCartney 2, Tug of War, and Pipes of Peace. And that's really pretty much to kind of keep it all in print right. as he's moving from Concord Music to right. Universal. That's, I think that's you know primary purpose of all this, I think. Mm-hmm. But um, mm-hmm. do either of you have any interest in any of this? No. Mm-mm. Because really, in this case, the the difference is what label is putting it out. You know, the CDs, right. the single CDs have all come out. The 180 gram vinyl has all come out. You know, as each archive release was released, it came out with a vinyl version too. I got those. The colored vinyl is nice. I'm not sure I need it. Certainly not at the prices of vinyl these days. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, same same here. I mean, I there's no, I I have no plans on, on picking those up. There's no there's no reason to. I mean, you know, if you really are are, you know, talking about these things that that are coming out at Christmas time, I mean, if you really want to, you know, use your money for something that you don't have. There's the two TMOQ things, the Magical Mystery Tour and the second John Lennon, you know, uh, DVD. I mean, those are, you know, I mean, that would make more sense. And a, and a second volume of Magical Mystery Tour is coming out, too. Oh, okay. So that makes four discs of Magical Mystery Tour stuff altogether. Right. So. I think it's time for our Magical Mystery Tour party at Alan's house. Uh-oh. Okay. <laughs> oh, my. Sure. Come right up. <laughs> uh, okay, Steve is booking his flight right I'm now. Booking, yeah, I'm booking, booking. I'm booking my flight right now. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> All right. Last Friday it was Record Store Day, and Paul McCartney, who's been very good for putting out releases of some kind for Record Store Day, put out two singles for Wonderful Christmas Time. This is the newer version of the song. It's actually an a cappella version. Of Wonderful Christmas Time that was heard on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. Jimmy's on the recording with his house band, The Roots, and the cast members of the movie Sing, and Paul is in it. So um, there were two singles that were released, seven-inch vinyl singles. One was green, the other red. Both have B-sides, which are not McCartney recordings. But... um, Am I mistaken? Did you, I thought you bought these two singles I got Friday. Them. I got them, yeah. Okay. The, the green one has the Decemberists, Jesus Christ, on the other side, and the red one has Peace, Live at the Sheen Center by Nora Jones on the B-side. Okay. And what do you think of this new version of the song? Well, um, I, I sh- should hasten to add that all of these songs, both B-Sides and Wonderful Christmas Time, are on the new Holidays Rule Volume 2, which is out right. on CD. So you needn't have rushed to Record Store Day to get them. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's... <laughs> you know how I feel about Wonderful Christmas Time. I mean, it's one of my least favorite McCartney songs. But here <laughs> is the inconsistency... That is me, okay? I have Holidays Rule 2 on CD. And yet, when Bull Moose Records announced that it would be open at 6 a.m. on Record Store Day, um, I was actually there at 6.05 a.m. to (laughs) buy specifically these two discs of Wonderful Christmas Time. (laughs) Wow. Wow. Then I got there and realized and found out that they weren't able to sell record store day stuff until eight. So I'm sitting here saying, <laughs> oh, well, no. what is the point of opening at six for record store day if you can't sell this stuff till eight? And I was going to go home because everything in Portland is five minutes away from everything else in Portland. And I figured I could spend a couple of hours and go back at eight. 
But then I figured, okay, if you're the kind of person who would get up at six to go to a record store for record store day, you probably are also the kind of person who can entertain yourself for two hours in a record store without Mm -hmm. much problem. So I hung out there. And it turned out that because, you know, I was there, I was talking to the guy behind the counter who is Bomos is really good at being able to tell you what they have in stock at any of their stores. Um, And at the store I was in, it turned out that they had three copies of the green one and one copy of the red one. However, they were giving the first five people who came for Record Store Day a a number which entitled us to five minutes with the Record Store Day stuff by ourselves before generally letting everybody else look at the Record Store Day stuff. And Mm -hmm. there was actually one other person who neglected to read the fine print. So he was number one, I was number two. I knew that there was only one one red one. So I went immediately to where the singles were, rifled through it, and got the one red one and one of the three green ones, um, <laughs> which I will never play because if I want to play it, I can play the CD. Um, True. And whether I'd want to play Wonderful Christmas Time, I mean, the odds are low. Okay. <laughs> You've had your say there. I really don't believe that you that you hate the song as much as you say you do. Well, but uh, I just because when we discussed this song before, the reason why you didn't like the song was what exactly? Because once you hear a strain of it, you just can't get it out of your mind, and it gets more and more and more annoying as you try to get it out of your mind and hear something else. I mean, obviously, the thing to do is to put on "Life with the Lions" to banish. <laughs> wonderful christmas time so next time that happens i'm going to try that well it is a talent to be able to write something that stays in your head and if it stays in your head you must like it uh, there's a, I, I, again I, re- I recommend the roll doll story to you where um <laughs> someone wrote a song that was so catchy that ultimately people were dying because <laughs> it was driving them nuts anyway well, to that I would say there's a thin line between love and hate. Yeah, okay. So did you two get <laughs> get your copies of the... No. No? No. Did not. Because I, I, I haven't... I haven't uh, I'm going to buy the CD of Holiday's Rule, Volume 2. I haven't bought it yet. But I have heard the new version of Wonderful Christmas Time. Well, we've had a while to hear it since it was on Jimmy Fallon's show. I Great. do like the acapella treatment of it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's different. And, uh, you know, there are lots of cover versions now of Wonderful Christmas Time, which shows that a lot of people do like it. So, so, um, so if, and if you're, if, then if you're going by sales of this version of Wonderful Christmas Time, then of the three of us, presumably, I like it best. I guess that's true, Alan. Isn't that weird? <laughs> I, I don't know. How but I have every intention this. of buying it. I have every intention <laughs> of buying it. I'll probably get it eventually. I'm not gonna. I'm not running to get it though. You're not gonna get okay. up at six o'clock to. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. I wouldn't do that for just about anything <laughs> at this point. But um, speaking of McCartney, there is a brand new McCartney composition called "Songbird in a Cage" by a French-British singer and actress by the name of Charlotte Gainsbourg. This song actually um, is the result of Paul and Charlotte having lunch back in 2011, and she asked him if he'd write a song for her. And so (laughs) it hasn't come out until now. They recorded the song last year, and uh, Paul plays guitar on it, bass and piano, Hmm. and it's on her new album called Rest. And I know that we've all heard the song, so Steve, why don't you say what you think of the song? from what you've heard so far. It, you know, it, it, we were sitting here listening to it before we got started, and I, I swear it sounded, it reminded me a hell of a lot of Linda. Yeah. <laughs> a, an all, I mean, an awful, awful lot. I mean, I was mm-hmm. like, whoa, mm-hmm. this is really, really interesting. I mean, I didn't, at first I didn't particularly care for the song, and then I started listening, and I'm going, my God, this is, 
it, it, it sounds like Glinda. Mm-hmm. It, 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 it was, and that actually made it sound a little better to realize that. Um, mm-hmm. The song itself, I'm not sure the song itself is, you know, all that fantastic, but to hear, and, and you can't really, I couldn't really make out the words. Could you guys? I could, uh, yeah. Except for the refrain. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, that Linda tie in there was just, was really interesting. Really, really interesting. Mm. So, Alan? Um, you know, I kind of like the sound of it, the instrumental sound, and uh, I couldn't really make out too much of the lyrics either, apart from the refrain. Um, but yeah, I mean, now that Steve mentions Linda, I, 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 I can hear what he's saying. It sounds like one of Linda's songs from mm-hmm. you know, the posthumous album. But, uh, you know, I, I mean, I didn't, I have to hear it again. I, I it didn't strike me as, you know, Paul at his melodic best or anything like that. But yeah, well, a nice sounding uh, track. I mean. Right. Yeah, it's it's kind of funny that that uh, that you brought up Linda because that's the first thing I thought of when I heard it's, it. Because... It sounds like Seaside Woman, actually. Uh, if you, uh, that's kind of what it reminded me of. Is that what is that what you were thinking? No, because Seaside Woman is all melody, and this song. The verses are – she's talking her way through it. So it's more like Oriental Nightfish. Oh, okay. Something like that. There we go. There we or go. White, White Prairie, something like that, whereas the chorus has a melody to it. And it's got a bit of an electronic sound, maybe a little fireman-ish. Mm-hmm. But the, the vocals there do remind me quite a lot of Linda. This is something I could hear Linda doing now if she was alive. Right. It sounded very reggae. That's why I, I think – I was a bit, bit ori- yeah, Oriental Night Fish is probably closer, closer mm-hmm. to it. But um, yeah, the, the the reggae kind of accent in there was very noticeable. Mm. Okay, and speaking of Paul, another news item: he continues his one-on-one tour with six dates in Australia, which starts December second. That's this Saturday, plus one date in New Zealand. So. I think, like the two of you, will be most curious to see if he makes any changes in his set list. I personally am not expecting it, but you never know. He hasn't he hasn't been doing it recently, but I would also think the fact that he's finally going to Australia, he's going to do something. I know he's got at least one fan event. Uh, I, I guess some kind of not obviously a live event, live meeting, but I think some kind of electronic thing he's doing down there. But I wouldn't be surprised if he if he throws in something for them. Wouldn't surprise me at all. It seems like he he finally he's finally answered the call. I mean, they've been clamoring and clamoring for years for him to come back, and finally, now that he's done it, right. um, I would think that he will that he, that he'll do something special. Yeah, I'm so happy for the people in Australia. <laughs> they really, I mean, it's it's. It, I don't know if you've heard the comments, but I've I've gotten comments over the years from people who were really. I, I hate to word. I don't want to use. I hate to word use the word angry, but they were. They were not happy. They mm-hmm. were not happy. So this this is this is a big deal for them. And I any for any of you in Australia, actually, we'd love to hear from you if you do go to the show. Mm-hmm. Um, and let us know what you how, how it was. We'd love to hear from you. So, but yeah, I mean, they were they were not pleased that he kept, you know, doing all these tours and going back to Mexico and South America over and over again and not coming. And finally, they got through to him, and I'm I'm really happy for him. Really, really happy for him. I kind of wonder why it's been that long. You know, a gap. Uh, last time was 1993 that he played in Australia. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I just I can't imagine why. Well, initially, he's taking this long. initially you remember it was because of the 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 bombing. Oh right, yeah. The bomb he canceled out out of the bomb because of the bombing. Now I I don't I I don't understand why it took him so long to do it. I mean we can speculate and guess here, but there's really no way to know. I don't know, Alan. I, if you have the thought. You know, jump in, but I, I there, there's there was no really real reason. I mean, there have not been. I mean, if it if it was terrorist attacks, he was worried about. It. Australia hasn't had many, so I don't know what what the deal was there as far as yeah. You know, it doesn't make, as, it doesn't make sense because he's also been in the Far East um, more mm-hmm. recently, and 
usually he pops by Australia when he's also doing Japan, right? I mean, not usually, but in 93 he did, for instance, I think. so. Right. But, I mean, the, the gap from from then to now. Yeah. There's just no, there's no logic to it. No. Mm. Yeah, well, the demand is there, obviously, so I, I just don't know why. Well, yeah, I mean, they've been very, I mean, those fans down there have been very, very loyal, mm. very loyal to him. So I'm, like I said, I'm glad that he's finally given into that. And I, you know, and, and I, I wish them the best for, for those shows. I, I do. So. Right. Okay. A couple of new releases I want to bring up. First of all, our friends, the Weaklings, have released two digital singles, and they're both Christmas singles. The first of which which came out about three, four weeks ago, I believe, Mm -hmm. was Revolution Wonderland. It's a combination of The Beatles' Revolution and Winter Wonderland. (laughs) And it's a nice mashup of the two, and they pull it off magnificently well. Have you guys heard it? I have have heard that one, Um, and it's very cute. It's very, very cute. Um, they did a, they did a very nice job with that. Yeah, it starts off with the revolution riff, and they do the shooby doo ops <laughs> in there too, and right. it's it's really clever. Mm-hmm. And then there's uh, the brand new single, which is Christmas time is here again. They do that song and they mix it with the melody of flying, huh. which I think is very effective. <laughs> so um, it's very short too; it's only a little more than two minutes, but it, it's only available digitally. So uh, I certainly advise you guys to check it out. They're having they're having a lot of fun. I mean, the, between those two singles, those guys are, are really are really having a lot of fun, and uh, they're really uh, uh, their stuff is really getting is really good. I mean, it's not you know there are so many tribute groups out there, and and you know that are putting out stuff that are just putting out you know covers. I mean, they're trying to do original stuff, and it's really, it's it's really nice that they are. Yeah, so. it's a combination of the two. Mm-hmm. It's hard yeah. to imagine that you know, just given the kinds of songs they are and what the lyrics are and everything, that Revolution, Revolution, and Winter Wonderland could really go together. But I, I'm looking forward to hearing that myself. Well, that's the kind of thing that the Fab Four were doing, you know. To that extent, though, I don't, I don't know that they were doing it like that. Oh, I think so. They were blending traditional and rock and roll Christmas songs, mixing that with, uh, you know, melodies and and hooks Mm -hmm. um, and the similar instrumentation that the Beatles used. So uh, I think that the Weaklings are doing a great job doing that as well. So, okay. And then there is a band called Apple Jam that I think I first found out about. From you, Steve. On yeah, you probably. Examiner. Yeah, because they're 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 out of Seattle, um, mm-hmm. and they were and they are the guys that did the annual Apple Rooftop tribute show um, at the end of January. I think they still do it, uh, and they've had Alan White um, up there uh, to play with them. They've had um, Ken Mansfield, the author, uh, who was on the rooftop that day. Um, with them uh, in past years, uh, so yeah, they've they, they've they've done this kind of Apple rooftop thing every year. That's one yeah. thing one thing they've uh, been famous for. But yeah, that they're they've been around for several years. Yeah, well, apart from being a Beatles tribute band, they also put out uh, an album a while back called "Off the Beatle Track," right? In which they they covered a lot of the songs that the Beatles gave away to other artists. Yeah. Kind of similar to what the Weaklings have been doing as well. Only the Weaklings try to take a lot of the the rarer material. And they um, and and the and Apple Jam did all covers. Not mm-hmm. they, didn't, they didn't do any original, and they also obviously tried to mirror the the Beatles style. Um, mm-hmm. And I mean, as I, I have, you know, it was not. It's a nice. It's not. They they weren't the first ones to do it. I remember a um, a Japanese vinyl um, release with the same thing, uh, of you know the same idea, several years before Apple Jam did what they did, and it was, okay. it, was it was fun, it was fun. Yeah. Well, anyway, the band has released a new digital single, mm-hmm. and it happens to be the Rishikesh song, which is the John Lennon composition, and 
the recording that John made of it that many of us have heard with him playing on an acoustic guitar ended up on the John Lennon anthology box set. <laughs> And so this band has just released it as a digital single. And the reason why they're doing this is because next year they're going to be celebrating the 50th anniversary of the White Album. And they're going to be covering the White Album, putting out a release. And the Rishikesh song is going to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. So this is like a little teaser to what's about to happen next year. Probably it'll come out in November you know, because that's when uh, the White Album came out. But um, you can get this new recording of the Rishikesh song from Apple Jam uh, on iTunes. It's also on Amazon, Spotify, and CD Baby. Okay. okay. All right. I also wanted to call attention, if you happen to live in the New York area, as this is that time of year when we're uh, at the anniversary of John's death, as well as George's. But um, there are two John Lennon tribute concerts that I'm aware of. Uh, that you might want to uh, check out and attend for yourself. One of them is from the group called Theater Within that we've known about for quite some time because every single year since John passed away, they've put on a tribute show in New York City. And this time, the concert's going to be at Symphony Space in New York City on December the 1st. And I know Patti Smith is one of the uh, performers that will be there for that show. Yeah, she's the, he she's the headliner, I believe. Yeah. And also, there's one that will take place on Long Island at uh, a place called The Space, which is in Westbury. And there is a really great cover band called Wondrous Stories, who took their name from the Yes Song, an album. And they, they've been known to cover Yes and the Beatles, and they do a lot of tribute shows, primarily on Long Island, the New York area. And they'll be doing a John Lennon tribute show on December the 9th. But not only is this band great, but they're going to have special guests appearing on stage with them. And the guests are Mark Hudson, Denny Lane, Steve Holly, and Gary Van Syok hmm. from hmm. Elephant's Memory. And a good friend of mine, Ed Ryan, who is an excellent musician and songwriter, who's been making a living as a musician uh, in his entire adult life. God bless him. And he actually, when I first started doing my Beatles show in 1982 on college radio, he was the co-host of mine for a year. So he's a fantastic singer. He's going to be on stage with all these other people. Again, that's at the Space in Westbury, Long Island. All those fine people. Kind of sounds like the Fest for Beatles fans with all those people there that I just mentioned. So, um, And speaking of the Fest for Beatles fans, we do have the list of... The guest that will be there, by the way, it'll be March 9th through the 11th at the Hyatt Regency in Jersey City. Neil Innes will be a guest. And for the first time ever, Randy Bachman. I don't know if you're aware that Randy's you know, a guest for the fest, but the reason why Randy's going to be there is because he's just uh, recorded a full album of George Harrison songs. Mm. And it's called By George, and so he's going to premiere it at the fest. Randy is also a um, a veteran of the All Star Band. That's true. As is Burton Cummings. So he had two members of the Guess Who that were in the All Stars, as well as Randy being in Bachman Turner Overdrive. Billy J. Kramer is going to be at the fest. Peter Asher and Jeremy Clyde, who are going to be doing some live dates together. You know, I'm sure you know about that, Steve, right? Yes, I, I think I've, I think I did hear about that. Um, but yeah. Yeah, and, so, and uh, Jeremy Clyde is great, and uh, P uh, of course Peter Asher is great too. But yeah, Jeremy Clyde, uh, I, I, it's, it's it's too bad that it's not Chad and Jeremy, but uh, boy, uh, uh, Jeremy is great, so that's good. Mm -hmm. I'm, gl I'm glad that they're both going to be doing that. Also, the Wigglings will be there, and Jeff Slate's Birds of Paradox. So, and then there's tons of authors, most of whom have been on this show. <laughs> And maybe, right. maybe maybe one or two members of the show, even. Maybe. Well, I'll be there. Okay. I'll be there, kind of hoping maybe one of you will drift over there, <laughs> if you so desire. Also, um, Alan, you wanted to talk about something that you just attended in Portland, something called Beatles Night? Beatles Night, yeah. Um, so here in Portland, uh, Maine, the Maine Portland, um, 
they've uh, 15 years ago they started doing a, a Beatles night on the day after Thanksgiving, and uh, now they've, they've they've been doing it every year. It's become really popular. It's run by uh, a musician named Spencer Alby, who's you know, made CDs of his own that have been you know pretty well reviewed nationally, and um, you know it's his his stuff is all original stuff, um, but he is clearly a, a big Beatles fan too. Um, and among his collaborators is another musician here named uh, Sean Marin, who uh, does all the arrangements. And um, they get together like all of like people from a lot of the big groups around here. Uh, so from, you know, from a Portland perspective, it's like concert for Bangladesh, you know, it's like every bits from uh, this band and that band and, you know, all, all get together to do this. And they do pretty exact versions of Beatles and solo tracks, um, but with enough leeway. I mean, they're not slavish imitations. There's enough leeway for there to be some improv and, uh, you know, the vocal phrasing is different, you know, they're, they're not imitations, but they're very precise about the arrangements. So, uh, this year there were three concerts, um, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday on Friday night, which was the only one that I was able to get to. They did all of revolver plus another hour of other things. Uh, the second night, Saturday, they did all of Sergeant Pepper and then the Sunday concert was sort of a mixed program of, you know, stuff everybody loves. So, you know, Revolver was, I mean, it really was brilliantly done. Um, very good musicians and, um, you know, they have brass and strings. They did some rescoring here and there. For instance, in the, in the non-Revolver part, they did do three tracks from Sgt. Pepper, including the title track. Um, and so the horn break, which on Pepper is four French horns, they did with, um, I think, two trumpets and two trombones. But, you know, yeah. you, you would have to, you'd have to sort of be, a, you know, sort of a real beetle geek to pick up the little differences. But um, beautifully sung. Uh, Spencer Alby uh, has a really great, powerful voice, and he's um, particularly good on the McCartney stuff. You know, he has the range for it. He has the power for it. I, I thought, you know, and your bird can sing. They had two guitarists doing the the twin lead there, and it was it was just great. Uh, nice. Yeah, you know, and they had uh, it was it it it's really an awful lot of fun. And like I I think I talked about this when after they did Abbey Road a couple of years ago, where one of the startling things to me is that. You know, I don't think anybody on the stage had even been, you know, born within a decade or two of those albums originally coming out. But they quite clearly love the stuff um, enough to do it like that well. And uh, so it, it's that's this is the 15th annual version of it. And um, it, it seems to have become a tradition here. And I think that's great. Wow. I tell you, what, what impresses me most about what you said is that they actually have musicians that play brass and play string instruments. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, one of them was a they, – they were each discrete groups, the brass and strings. Well, the, the strings were, I think, the Portland Youth Rock Orchestra. <laughs> and I can't remember the name of the brass group, um, but they were really quite good. And, uh, you know, and there was a conductor – for their parts. And then when they weren't needed, they were off the stage, you know, so they didn't, unlike for instance, the Portland symphony, which I heard earlier this year, do all of Sergeant Pepper. I mean, they added orchestral parts for songs that didn't need orchestral parts. I mean, these guys did it pretty much as it is, you know, and, uh, mm. and it was really powerfully done. I, I just loved it. They did a bunch of solo. They opened, I think, with Live and Let Die. Um, hmm. oh. So, you know, you're starting off with needing the strings and brass, too. They didn't do uh, pyro, but uh, <laughs> <you know. laughs> but it was, okay. it, was, it was quite good. They did I Am the Walrus, a um, bunch of other things. But, you know, Revolver was the main thing. And then they did a few other things after Revolver. They ended with Well, My Guitar Gently Weeps, beautifully done, too. Hmm. So, wow, that's the kind of thing I'd love to see. 
yeah, yeah well, you know, sounds, everyone move up, move up here to Portland. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe we can vote, vote that guy, out of, vote your uh, governor out while we're at it. <laughs> right. Yes, right. you should. Right. Yes. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I believe he's uh, term limited out at the next oh. election. He'll be out anyway. So. Okay. So you really should just you know move up here so move that you up. can go to yeah. Beatles night every year. <laughs> yeah, and get lobster, make it. and get lobster cheaper. <laughs> Okay. If you can make it a little bit warmer up there, then uh, maybe I'd consider it. Yeah, that is um, downside. Either, either of you guys watch eight days a week on PBS last week? Nope. I did. You did? You did? Yeah. No, I, I, did. I didn't. I did not. But what'd you th- what you uh, What were they giving away? With a donation, you could get the DVD, and they also had – there was a book they were giving away. Um, I'm trying to remember. I, I think it was on 1967. It was a PBS book. It was one that they put together. Okay. Um, and I think they put this, the CD in for Sgt. Pepper, I believe. I don't remember. You know, forgive me if I got this wrong. But um, it, it was kind of interesting. You know, I, there's a number of people that I've spoken to who never saw the documentary right. and watched it on PBS. So for them, they found it fascinating. And right. obviously, they're not going to be as critical as we would be. Right. But um, – you know that's that's you know I find that really important because there's so many casual fans out there that would only become more interested in the Beatles from watching that. Yeah, right. and um, I did notice that there was there was a few plugs in there. Julian Lennon did a quick thing about supporting really? PBS, <laughs> um, and Dick Cavett did one too, where he used part of his interview with John and Yoko as if he was talking to them now. You know, wow. you know how, how they do that. John responding to something that Dick Cavett would say now. But uh, it was clever how that was done. But, um, you know, I enjoyed it. You mm. know, I, I still love seeing it. I, I still like seeing the rare footage. And, um, you know, I look at it as being a mainstream release. But it's still yeah. an important release. That's there all. Was, there was a lot of enthusiasm on Facebook from people who had not seen it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I... Having seen it in the theater and on on TV several times, I didn't sit and watch it. I probably probably would have been interesting to see who who did the plugs here too, but uh, no, I didn't I didn't see it. But uh, oh, you know what? I just remembered they were giving away Live at the Hollywood Bowl on CD. Hmm. I don't think they were giving away Sgt. Pepper, but they had the DVD and Live at the Hollywood Bowl together, which would make more sense. Which yeah, would, which would make more sense. Yeah, because of the the theme of the of the film. So. And also, um, the hosts of, of the night were Dennis, were Dennis Elsis, who we know from his years on WNEW FM, right. and he interviewed John in 1974 when Walls and Bridges came out, which they used in the documentary, mm-hmm. part of that interview. Okay. And uh, Maria Molito from Q104, they sounded great together. So, and then um, they also had the, the Sgt. Pepper, the musical revolution um, after that. Right. Which which we talked about it on a full show. That was a that was actually pretty good, as I recall. So, it has some good moments. I like a heavy analysis like that, going really deep into the songs mm-hmm. the way he does. But right. there were some things that I, I thought were kind of a stretch, as we okay. discussed. You right. Know. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about uh, very briefly this new thing that actually we found out about today as we're doing this show. Ringo and his all-star band, his most recent all-star band of the last six years, doing something for Bedstock.com. This was um, a video that was made of Ringo and the all-stars in bed. <laughs> I think they're covered by a, by a blanket or something. Uh, and they're, they're singing uh, a short version of Yellow Submarine. Yeah, about a minute. Yeah, and this is all being done for a great cause – You want to tell the folks what that is, Alan? Um, Well, looking at the website, which you you can go to um, uh, um, bedstock.com, it says artists play in bed for kids who are stuck in theirs. So it's, you know, it's obviously to, uh, well, the, the other thing they say is view over 100 performances now to help deliver the healing power of music to sick kids and teens. And, um, you know, Ringo's there, and uh, Ed Sheeran is there, and I'm not, Nick Jonas. I mean, uh, I'm sure it's a lot of fun. I mean, the Ringo one is fun. That's, um, 
you know, for, for our purposes, the main thing. Um, it's good of him to do, I think. Sure. Mm. Okay. Yeah, it's, yeah, I would definitely advise everyone to try to, to look it up online. Yep. Also, I think uh, we should briefly mention the passing of David Cassidy, mm. who um, I was a fairly big fan of because I followed the Partridge family when it was on television. And I loved a lot of that music. You know, it was great pop music, very well crafted. And he actually had contact with all four Beatles. He has said in various interviews that um, after he saw the Beatles debut on Ed Sullivan, the very next day, he went out and bought a guitar. And the Beatles were always his favorite of all artists, although he had very strong R&B leanings. He talked about a lot of artists in the 60s, like Otis Redding, and he loved B.B. King. But... Um, I have heard various things about David. Uh, he had lunch with uh, John and May Pang at the time when John was separated from Yoko in L.A. Um, I know he had some contact with George. He did have a top 20 single in the U.K. with a live version of Please Please Me. And um, in addition to that, one thing that I used to play quite frequently on my show back in, well, my days in New Jersey radio on WDHA was a cover that David did of Tomorrow, the McCartney song from mm. Wildlife. Very cool mm. that he recognized that song. And I looked online and I noticed on Wikipedia, I know Wikipedia is not always accurate, but they have a list of the charts and how well these, his singles did around the world. And Tomorrow came out as a single and it went top 10 in New Zealand. Just the fact that he recognized that song. I think is really cool. It was on his album called Home is Where the Heart Is. So I know that you said, uh, Steve, you had something you wanted to read about David? Yeah, let me just pull it up again. Um, I was just looking. I one uh, uh, Interestingly enough, this week, I was going through my record store bargain bin, and I found his Now and Then album. And I was looking to see if he did any Beatles songs on it. He didn't. But I have his, I, ha I, I bought his, um, his uh, e-book off of uh, Amazon this week. It's five dollars for anybody that's into ebooks, which is actually cheap. But he he says that the Beatles he tuned it, he watched the Beatles on Ed Sullivan and he said the next day he told his mother, Please mom, let me get an electric guitar. He said at that time I was playing drums and had just begun to play the guitar. I'd play in garage bands and little combos. We'd get together and play Beatles songs. But I didn't want to be a professional musician. I just love to play. What the Beatles did for me when I saw them and Ed Sullivan was make me want to be in a band with three other guys and do what I eventually ended up doing with the Partridge family. Influence millions of people. Mm -hmm. So, there Very we go. Nice. There, there we go. And I actually have a quote that I want to read here from David Cassidy regarding something that happened to him with John Lennon. And this actually appears in WashingtonLive.com and it's also on another website, midliferocker.com. This quote from David Cassidy, he said, John and Yoko had a friend who was a very close friend of mine, and he brought John over to my house. He just walked in, and it was New Year's Eve, and I remember I was in the kitchen, and Susan, who played Cassidy's sister, Lori Partridge, on the TV show, meaning Susan Day, tapped me on the shoulder and said, David, there's a beetle in the house. Later, we would go into my music room, we start playing, and I, of course, instantly go back to the early Beatles songs that I first learned. And since then, he had written another 500 songs and hadn't played with the Beatles in however long, so I retaught him a couple of the early Beatles songs. Please Please Me, some others. John was musically my hero, but what I also loved about him was he had a remarkable sense of humor, a great passion for life. He's probably the most unique person I've ever met. To get to meet him, to get to know him, to get to play with them. And I remember one of the most amazing compliments I ever heard. They were asking John about the early days of the Beatles. And he said, oh, don't ask me. I don't remember. Ask David Cassidy. He was bigger than we were. I read that and I went, oh my God, how did that happen? It was such a great experience for me to get to know him. End of quote. That's a wonderful quote. That, that yeah. really is. That's a wonderful story. Well, there are a number of people, not just David, who will say that at that time, in the early 70s, he, to a lot of people, he was the biggest thing out there. Right, right. You know, I do know there was a concert that he gave in Australia, which apparently sold over 100,000 seats, 
which was unheard of back then. But that's how big David Cassidy was. But it just goes to show you, you know, what a big Beatle fan he was. And it's good to know that, um, you know, he had a friendship and admiration for John that strong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was that was quite interesting. All right, we just want to say, um, as we almost finish our show up here, that um, we got a response from the last show that we did, which was with Mark Lewison, coming from David Bedford. Uh, This all had to do with what we covered in our show with Mark regarding uh, the firing of Pete Best as drummer in the Beatles. So he, um, he wrote back to us. It's on the Podbean website. And uh, it's, it's, also what... on, it's also on Facebook. And actually on Facebook, there are several more responses there on, on Podbean. There's only the one comment, but on the on our Beatles, uh, on our um, show, fa- things we said today, Beatles radio fans, Facebook page. He has interacted with a bunch of people who made comments and has continued to comment. So. Uh, you might want to check that out if you don't already go to the page. Um, go to the page and, ch- and check out the that uh, that thread. Yeah, he, he even says he doesn't want this to be uh, a Mark Lewis and versus David Bedford thing. Right. right. But obviously, when David has his um, new project out, Finding the Fourth Beetle, we'd love to have him back on the show. And and obviously, anytime Mark wants to come on the show, he's more than welcome. So uh, and we'll bring up that subject again, I'm sure. Oh, yes. All right. Any other news we want to bring up here on the show? I think we've covered it, eh? I think, I think, we, I think we've... we've uh, uh, how about the weather? <laughs> <laughs> or sports. That's about... <laughs> those are the only two things we haven't covered so far. That's right. We haven't done the weather and the sports. It's not baseball season, so I don't care about sports. <laughs> All right, so why don't we just give the folks our contact information? We'll start with you, Steve. Beatlesexaminer at gmail dot com. I have a, um, a Beatles news and information page on Facebook where I post Beatles stories and all my all my freelance stories, as I did today with the Al Jardine. Big, the Al Jardine news I broke on Billboard today. Why don't so, you tell the folks what that is? Well, for anybody that's a Beach Boy fan, uh, Al's going to go out and start doing storyteller shows. As of this moment, um, as of right now, there are only four shows booked, two in Minnesota and two in Arizona. But that may not be all of them. So, But, yeah. we, but uh, we will see. But and anyway, I can tell you. Because mm-hmm. I've seen many Brian Wilson shows, and in, in fact, uh, not that long ago, probably about a month and a half ago, right. seeing Brian in this area. But uh, I've seen his Pet Sounds show, and he has Al in the band, and Al's son, who's phenomenal. He's who a great. Be, yeah, who will be who will be part of the show? Al uh, Matthew will be part of the show. I talked. Well, I talked to Al last night about for about uh, twenty twenty five minutes, and that's. The idea of the show, it's basically going to be its basically going to be him and Matt with Al telling stories and him and Matt singing and, and playing music. So, Yeah. And I got to say, I really admire Matt a lot because at various times in the, in the concert with Brian, if ever Brian couldn't – if he knew he wasn't able to hit a note or do a phrase properly, Matt was there to pick him up. Right. Or if he, or if he couldn't remember a line, which could happen. If you see Brian in concert, mm-hmm. and uh, you know Matt filled that role perfectly, he also sang "Don't Worry, Baby." I mean, to a T. <laughs> wow. He was so wonderful singing "Don't Worry, Baby." Mm-hmm. But yeah, I hope he comes to this area, to uh, New York, Connecticut. Yeah, I, I I told him the same thing that I hope he comes to my area too. So cross your fingers, folks. Yeah. Okay, Alan. Um, yeah, you can reach me at um, Facebook, uh, either under Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Okay, and as for me, Ken Michaels, you can reach me at my email address, which is everylittlething at att.net. You can also be a friend of mine on Facebook at Ken Michaels. And my website is kenmichaelsradio.com. Just want to mention two quick things about something going on on my website. Every now and then I do a special contest where you can win something unique or something really great. And actually, in this case, 
You can win three Paul McCartney CDs in one package. They're from the remastered catalog. These are actually the ones from Concord Music that I still have left over. It's three of his CDs, and they're remastered, and they're the special editions with bonus tracks on there, like B-sides and demos and stuff. To find out more, just go to my website at kenmichaelsradio.com. I also just did a new interview with a guy named John Montagna. This is someone who's had a pretty impressive career. He started out through the guitarist Godfrey Townsend to be part of the house band for something called A Walk Down Abbey Road, which we brought up here a few times on this show. It's various stars performing their own songs, their own hits as a band together, like an all-star band. And half of the show is that, playing their own material. Half was playing Beatles songs. And John was in the house band for that. From there, he went to be in Alan Parsons' band, touring the world for seven years. And then he was in the house band for Hippie Fest and for the Happy Together Tour. And back in July, he did a concert in New York City at the Cutting Room, which was a tribute concert to Ringo. It was all Ringo music. So I did an interview with him. He's a big Beatle fan. He just wrote an article for Culture Sonar in which he talked about why he thought Cloud Nine was a better album than All Things Must Pass. Hmm. So we get into a conversation about that. And that's on my website. It's on Interviews 4. That's the name of the page on my website at kentmichaelsradio.com. So it's nice to talk to another Beatle geek, other than these two Beatle geeks right here that I share the show with. And so uh, if you can, check it out on my website, kentmichaelsradio.com. All right. This has been great. Thanks so much for tuning in to Things We Said Today. And for Steve Marinucci, Alan Cozen, and myself, Ken Michaels. Again, thanks for tuning in, and we will see you next time. Next time.